Welcome to episode number six of Pillars of Worship, a seven-part series on the history of worship in Barbados, from Anglicanism to abundant life. Now, in the last episode, we told the story of the Methodists in Barbados, 18th century evangelists inspired by the charismatic Englishman John Wesley. But like the Quakers before them, the Methodists were persecuted for their views and their opposition to slavery. But we must note with some irony that Dr. Nathan Lucas, the famous diarist, in his diaries of the period, reported that our very first Methodist minister was in fact a bigamist. Here are his words. The first preacher within his first year married Hare at the very time he knew he had a wife already in England alive, who most uncourteously made her appearance here six months afterwards, demanded her husband, and carried him from the island. I remember him well, a man so pious that he could hardly step across a tunnel without giving thanks to God." Unquote. In this episode, we look at two other minority groups who were also once persecuted and treated as though not deserving of citizenship if not considered a downright danger to the society, our early Jewish community and the Roman Catholics. Both have made huge contributions to our development over time, and both Jews and Catholics are pillars of modern Barbados. There were probably Jews in Barbados from the first decade. A letter by one Abraham Jacob of London in 1828 refers to business conducted in Barbados, while Dutch records refer to business between Pernambuco and Sephardic Jews in Barbados. Dr. Watson, our local expert on the history of Judaism in Barbados, says that by the 1640s, Jews were moving here, and the council minutes of 1654 include a request from the Jewish community for entry of Jews from Brazil. Richard Ligon, living here in 1647, refers in his book, A True and Exact History of Barbados, to a Jew named Solomon, who undertook to teach the inhabitants how to make bricks, but apparently was a dismal failure. Ligon says, when it came to the touch, his wisdom failed and we were deceived in our expectations. By 1654, Jews who had been thrown out of Recife and Pernambuco in Brazil because they were simply too successful in the prosperous sugar trade, got approval from Oliver Cromwell to settle in Barbados, and a Jew named David Rafael de Mercado is credited with the new way of making sugar mills. Certainly, the earliest cattle mills were rapidly replaced with windmills in the Dutch style, and this efficient early use of wind energy was key to the rapid explosion of our sugar industry. The synagogue was certainly built by 1664, when it's shown in a title deed, and it was given the name Nide Israel, which means the scattered of Israel. Within a few years, there was a population of more than 300, largely living in Swan Street, close to the synagogue. Although Swan Street was known for the next 200 years as Jew Street, they lived all around the historic core, especially in Suttle Street. Initially, the Jews weren't permitted to own significant numbers of slaves and therefore couldn't run sugar plantations. So they developed a thriving merchant and warehousing trade in Bridgetown. But that law was changed, and there was one important exception, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, who in 1834 owned 216 slaves who worked his sugar plantation. His name is remembered in our popular Brandon's Beach on property that he owned. And many other Jewish names remain. As Dr. Carl Watson has shown, while many remain loyal to their faith and their laws, many mixed, matched, and married with Christians free and slaves. And Jewish family names 
of Myers and Baruch became Mayers and Barrow, while the Costas, the Pisas, Daniel, Abraham, Pintos and Shannon eventually Christianized, took Christian wives and gave their names to thousands of Bayesian descendants. Dr. Watson has made an extensive study of the wills over 200 years, discovering the intimacy of relations between those early Jews, slaves and free coloreds and their children, for whom they made provision. The great hurricane of 1831 reputedly destroyed the old synagogue, and it was rebuilt, but it seems on the same site. The style can be described as Barbadian church vernacular, with Gothic or pointed arched windows on the upper floor and a handsome Georgian balustraded parapet roof to protect it from another hurricane. Another concession to design was, for hurricanes, rounded corners believed perhaps to deflect the wind and a feature found in a few other buildings of the period such as Avalon, the chronic disease research center. Although the Jewish community had already begun to dwindle, and by 1831 the community numbered less than a hundred, the rebuilding was accomplished with speed and splendor at a cost of 4,000 pounds and the consecration took place with pomp and ceremony on a bright and sunny afternoon on March the 19th, 1833. An account is given by Mr. Eustace Shilston in his splendid book, Monumental Inscriptions in the Jewish Synagogue at Bridgetown, Barbados, with historical notes from 1630. According to the editor of the Barbados Globe newspaper, recorded here by Mr. Shilston in his book, it was a day that would ever stand eminently distinguished in the annals of the Hebrew community of the town. The Globe recorded that about three of the clock on a bright and sunny afternoon in the month of March 1833, the people of the Hebrew nation in Bridgetown, Barbados, commenced to assemble in the courts and avenues of their synagogue and in the course of an hour, they were joined by a number of the most respectable inhabitants and ladies of grace, fashion, and beauty. It sounds like the opening of Parliament, doesn't it? Who were admitted to the galleries above to witness the interesting and impressive ceremony before them. The rebuilt synagogue was described as a new structure of exquisite taste and chaste design for the exercise of faith and worship. It has a footprint of 2,000 square feet, measuring 50 feet by 40 feet. A Palladian-style double staircase on the north side leads to the upstairs gallery within, where the ladies of the Jewish congregation were assigned their space for worship. A handsome marble fountain was placed in a classical niche in the inner courtyard. When the synagogue was sold, it was salvaged and now greets visitors at the entrance to the Barbados Museum. Ironically, the congregation was already dwindling by 1833 with the crisis in the sugar economy, and it's recorded that from 800 members in 1750, by 1850 there were only 71 practicing Jews. They had converted or emigrated. But some hung on until, by the 1920s, it was agreed that the synagogue should be sold. The last practicing Jew, Mr. Edmund Isaac Beiza, sold the entire property to Mr. Henry Graham Yarwood, a Bridgetown solicitor of Yarwood and Boyce, on April 27, 1928, for 500 pounds. The proceeds, records, and many artifacts were handed over to the Bevis Mark Synagogue in London, and it was covenanted that the purchaser would maintain the burial ground and the surrounding walls. The Ark and the Beamer, built by Bayesian fine craftsmen and the temporal, and the desk and the benches, and the mouldings all had to be reproduced and replaced, and the beautiful chandeliers replicated in the USA. It was used as solicitor's law offices and law library for some 40 years and then as a warehouse. The balcony had been removed and an upper floor installed. The graves were neglected, but the savior of the tombstones in a sense 
was the dedicated antiquarian Mr. Eustace Maxwell Shilston, a partner in the law firm of Cottle Catford and Company. Mr. Shilston started transcribing the inscriptions on the tombstones in the 1930s, and his book was published in 1958 by the Jewish Historical Society in London and republished in 1988 by Macmillan. Mr. Shilston's role in the Barbados Museum is commemorated in the Shilston Library there. In 1980, the government announced that it had purchased the synagogue and the cemetery and would demolish it and Cod's house next door, where Parliament was held in the 1830s and where the Emancipation Bill was proclaimed. The plan? To build a new Supreme Court. I read this in The Advocate on a plane flying to California for a conference and I nearly had a seizure. It was my Damascus moment and there was no turning back in my fight against the Philistines for the heritage of Barbados. And the hand of God intervened in the persons of Henry Altman, son of Moses Altman and Henry's son Paul. Moses had emigrated from Poland in 1931 the first of the Ashkenazi community who settled here in advance of Hitler's reign of terror. Paul and Henry Altman and key members of the Jewish community met with Prime Minister Tom Adams and vowed to find the money for restoration. Adams agreed. The synagogue and cemetery were vested in the National Trust and the rest is history. From my point of view, like uh, Professor Fraser, I have a background in, uh, of involvement in heritage and conservation and uh, in this case I had a second hat and that was uh, as being being a member of the Barbados Jewish community. Recognizing the value of the heritage and importance of the synagogue to Barbados, I took on the task of trying to uh, make it happen. And the task, like anything else, is one that you have to put a lot of time and effort and of course dedication to the cause. The synagogue had a wonderful history attached to it which we uncovered by doing some research in the Shilston Library of the Barbados Museum, found photographs of what it looked like originally and took them directly to Prime Minister Tom Adams. Uh, Prime Minister Adams was one who you could speak to, he was approachable, he understood. And it didn't take him long to come back with a, an agreement that allowed us to start the restoration of the synagogue. Um, we worked with the, Bar with the Commonwealth Jewish Council, we worked with the Canadian uh, uh, Jewish uh, equivalent as well as the American Jewish Congress. It was the Canadian Jewish Congress. And they were all helpful and of course the job is done. But along with doing the restoration of the synagogue we then went on and built the museum which tells the story of the contribution of the Jewish uh, presence to Barbados, the introduction of sugar, the fact that Barbados being a, a, a island that had great wealth from sugar were able to contribute to the first developments of communities in North America and, and these are there and very evident. Certainly the Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island knows that the money to build that synagogue and they are the first synagogue in the United States that that money came from Barbados as well as the synagogue in Charleston in South Carolina and several others. I know of Philadelphia as being another one. So that Barbados did what uh, was something quite amazing at the time and to be able to restore this synagogue and to make it active and, it's, and it is used and to have visitors come here and to use the synagogue as well as the museum and to see the new, uh, the mikveh which I'm sure has been uh, seen as a part of this uh, presentation. So we're very proud of it and uh, of course for me it was something very, very meaningful. The tombs have also been splendidly restored, revealing the fascinating inscriptions and the symbolism, both Jewish and Christian, the hand of God felling the tree of life, and the skulls and crossbones, symbols of death used by Jews and Christians. And the old schoolhouse, later warehouse, is now a magnificent museum of the Jewish diaspora and the Nida Israel community here. In searching for the rabbi's house, an unbelievable discovery was made. The ancient mikvah or spiritual bath, still flowing with fresh water. That story belongs to Dr. Watson and Celso Brewster, the museum curator. In 2008, 
A most important discovery was made at the Nide Israel uh, site here in Barbados, which was the mikveh, which is the oldest mikveh in the Americas, probably built sometime between 1644 and 1654. Um, the uncovering of the mikveh was conducted by Dr. Carl Watson of the University of the West Indies, his doctoral student Michael Stoner, and two assistants, Urban Johnson and Anthony Paris. What a story. A dramatic saga of the scattered of Israel, their traumas and their triumphs. A spiritual people, but a humane and a most human people. So come to the synagogue and the Nida Israel Museum and share their story, which is so much a part of Barbados and especially of historic Bridgetown.